So I'm trying to record ah. the atmosphere. Oh, yeah, with, all <laughs> <laughs> with all the ads. At this point, I could have presented you with a recorded talk of mine at the venue, but instead I'm going to immerse you in the subject in a more lively way. Quantum contextuality has been around for more than half a century. But recently it turned out to be essential for quantum computation and applicable in quantum communication and cryptography. To understand quantum contextuality, we should first explain what its opposite is, that is classical non-contextuality. According to it, classical observables must always have definite predetermined values. In contrast to quantum contextuality, which must not have such predetermined definite values. But let us first see in more detail how classical non-contextuality works. Well, I'll now simulate a classical particle entering a stern gerlach device or any black box device in three dimensions by means of the Paris Metro where I'll enter one of the Paris Metro's ports simulating the incoming gate of the device and now the classical particle that's me must exit to one of the three ports in three dimensions of a Stem Gerlach device for example or me exiting the Paris Metro to one of its three exits that I should consider to be orthogonal to each other. Okay. Alternatively, the particle can come out through the second gate as me exiting now the second port of the three orthogonal Paris Metro ports that I can exit in person. Or the classical particle can exit through the third exit of our Stern Gerlach device or any three dimensional black box device in the same way in which I'm now exiting 
through the third exit of the metro system, which is considered to be orthogonal to the previous two exits. When talking about the orthogonality of the exits, we should take into account that we speak about Hilbert spaces in the same way in which Stern-Gerlach device exits are all in one real plane of a three-dimensional space and still being orthogonal in the Hilbert space which describes the estate in the same way is our simulation made in such a way that all three exits are in one plane on the surface of the Paris city only we consider them to be orthogonal to each other in that Hilbert space sense. However, a particle cannot exit through two ports simultaneously. In the same way in which I cannot exit through two metro exits at the same time, simultaneously. Where the exit in an experiment means a click of a detector, it has our assignment of one to the particle in the same way in which non-detection reduces to an assignment of zero to the particle at that particular exit. Also, a classical particle cannot simply disappear. It has to come out from one of the exits of the Stern-Gerlach device in the same way in which I have to appear at one of the three designated, as I call them, orthogonal exits from the metro system. That means it cannot be in a classical theory that we ascribe value zero to all orthogonal exits in a particular experiment. With the previous metro simulation, we stress the fact that observables of a particle within a classical theory always assume definite values, binary ones. That is, a click or the silence of a detector when measured. When we mentioned Stern-Gerlach experiment when considering a classical particle and simulating measurements of observables of such a particle with the metro system and its entrances and exits, we wanted to explore to which extent an intrinsic angular momentum of the spin one particle entering a Stern-Gerlach device can be described by a classical theory as a simple vector property, a vector observable, which would behave in a classical way and thereupon where such classicality breaks, at which point it cannot be any more described by a non-contextual classical theory. This is where quantum contextuality comes in. It's quantum observables that cannot be assigned definite and predetermined values. Actually, this impossibility is best grasped by the cohen specker theorem from the 1967, which simply negates the two properties that we found that classical particles must have, as well as me coming out of the metro system in my simulation. And that is that there are quantum sets called Chi's sets, 
which observables, which vectors do not satisfy the previous two conditions we considered in our metro simulation and which every classical particle must satisfy. Such a property of Ks sets we call Ks property. The standard representation of orthogonalities between antiples is via vector components and their mutual inner products being equal to zero. So for example, in this case we have three-dimensional triplet and when we look at the other triplet which is rotated around one of the common vectors, in this case this one, then the inner products being equal to zero together give a system of six nonlinear equations which we have to solve in order to get the vector components, that is the coordinatization that supports this orthogonality between the vectors of the considered antipodes. However, there is a problem with solving such systems of nonlinear equations, and even the power of all supercomputers on Earth working in parallel is not enough to find even the simplest possible KS system. So we have to find a way to go around that exponential complexity limit and barrier of a brute force approach to our problem of finding sets of orthogonal vectors that would satisfy Chi's conditions. To circumvent that problem of nonlinearity and exponential complexity of solving nonlinear equations, we establish a correspondence between set of antiples of vectors and hypergraphs. Within this correspondence, a single vector corresponds to a vertex of a hypergraph. That means that in our example of three orthogonal vectors, we need three vertices and we represent their orthogonality by means of edges. which we now represent via scarves that connect these French caps, berets. That's a hypergraph representation of three orthogonal vectors in the standard representation. And now, if we want to represent another orthogonal triple, which shares one of the vectors with the previous one, as we have shown previously and rotated with respect to them, we have to add two new vertices and represent their orthogonality by the second edge. That's a three-dimensional 
case and in case we have got four dimensions we just add a fourth vertex and the tonality remains represented via the edge that connects these vertices. The edge can be a straight or curved line. Hypergraphs are actually linear, but to solve the problem whether they, they satisfied Kaya's conditions, we have to resolve <coughs> only statistically polynomial complexity problem, and that is solvable. So what's advantage of such an approach that we don't need the coordinatization at all. We can decide whether a set of edges and vertices that form a hypergraph satisfy Kai's condition or not without any reference to the coordinatization that we can ascribe to such sets, without any reference to vector components that we can assigned to vectors that are represented by the vertices. And that means that we can find a satisfactory and actually massive number of Kai sets before we approach the problem of finding continentization for them. Hypergraphs correspond to sets of orthogonal vectors in such a way that the vertices, which we are now going to represent by means of French caps, berets, corresponds to vectors themselves and orthogonalities are rep represented by means of edges that connect these vertices. As shown here by means of French scarves. So here we have got four orthogonal vertices and here the other four and if we now add a third orthogonality in the following way then we get the smallest possible hypergraph which satisfies the KS conditions from the Cochrane-Specker theorem. We can easily verify that by assigning number one represented by this bottle for example to one of the vertices for example this one and we immediately see that then we must assign value zero to all the other vertices but that means that the vertices on this edge should be assigned all value zero and that contradicts the second condition 
of the Koch and Specker theorem. If we try to assign, for example, one to this vertex, then we see that all the other vertices must be assigned value zero, and that means that all four of these vertices must be assigned value zero on this edge, and that again contradicts the second condition of the cohen specker theorem. However, this simplest KS set doesn't have a coordinatization. It means we cannot find vectors, either complex or real, that could be assigned to all of these six vertices. That means that it's void of its coordinatization and representation by means of vector components. Hypergraph structure corresponds to the structure of the vectors. And the difference is that vectors require coordinatization, while hypergraphs do not. In order to present the difference, I'll show a historical example of the earliest Cohen-Specker sets found by Asher Perez, Michel Kernaghan, and Adam Cabello and co-authors. So in 1991, as we can see here, Asher Perez found a four-dimensional set which satisfied the Cohen-Specker theorem and the disadvantage of his representation was that everything was numerical and referred to the coordinates and components of vectors he used. So it took three years to find another simpler chi set which is contained in the original Asher Perez's one. And then the next two years to find the third set by Cabello Estabans y Garcia Arsene, which we later on proved to be the smallest of all in four dimensions. As we can see, they are all numerical considerations and not graphical. That was the reason why it took so many years to find all these three sets that are actually with our tools possible to immediately connect with each other and to recognize within each other. To see that we shall look at the Perez 24, 24 meaning 24 vertices and 24 edges set. These two are isomorphic to each other. That means they are actually the same. And Kernaghan's set is represented here. Cabello's is represented here. We see that in our hypergraph representation, we can easily see that both Kernaghan and Cabello's are subsets of Perez's set. And actually, Perez even tried to find any subset by means of computer programs, but was unsuccessful. Let us see what we can do in order to show that they really 
can be easily reduced to, to each other. So we can have a look at the Perez set and we can start to just delete edges that are not needed to obtain Cabello's set. Let us do that. First, we should just delete this thing altogether. Now, we'll move Perez's set closer to Cabello's set. And now we can start to peel off edges one by one in order to get Cabello's set. Let us do that. First, we should move away the obstacles. Now we can remove all these edges. And as you can see, that's exactly Cabello's set, meaning that had they possessed and had they recognized the graphical structure of their sets, they would have been able to immediately see all the sets underneath, actually over 1,200 sets that are contained in the original Perez set. A similar thing we have with Kernaghan's set, which we can also reduce by deleting the edges that don't belong to Gernagan set from the Perez set. I can't because they are too loud. As you can see, the letters, so the names of the vertices are not the same. But that's the beauty of this approach because the coordinatization here is completely absent it's, and it's completely irrelevant how we name the particular vertices. What's important in writing them down is just to put any letters from the ASCII set of symbols to the vertices and then automatically according to structures four of them would always belong to a particular edge. We can freely change the letters and for example we can just follow the original set of Kernaghan and change the symbols. L doesn't belong here. And what we need instead of that L is number nine, which is now missing here. And we, we should just borrow it from the Kernaghan set. So as you can see, the structure is now completely the same with also this four, which should be here. So, and now we can find the coordinatization, which is not a problem when we have got the structure, but it is a problem for bigger sets. So, we have recently found a way to just find any set from the simplest possible coordinates. And when we look at such coordinates, which are here presented, in our program as 0, minus 1 and 1, those coordinates that Kernaghan, Perez and Cabello use, then we get a bigger set than Perez's, meaning then Perez's set is not the biggest master set for these coordinates, so that even Perez's 24, 24 doesn't use up all the components to construct all possible vectors they can from these basic components. So here we have got then the first set actually within this bigger master set that we get, which satisfies the Cohen-Specker theorem conditions, meaning 
that apart from this KS set, inside a bigger master set, we also obtain several smaller non-KS sets. The other application of our program is that we find any subset or critical set as shown here. And when we look, for example, at the possible sets that we can get that are critical, meaning that they are the smallest KS sets that would stop being KS sets if we remove any of their edges. We can see here that we immediately obtain Kernaghan set. Actually, we obtain two 2011 sets, that is sets with 20 vertices and 11 edges, and one of them is Kernaghan. And when we go through all these sets that we obtained, we also see here there is another critical set with 13 edges, and here Cabello's set with 18 vertices and 9 edges. And actually, we can obtain all critical sets that exist inside our master set. If we enlarge the number of our sets, we see that we also get the sixth one with 24 vertices and 15 edges. And that's all what we need because only critical sets are important for our experiments. The critical sets from which we cannot remove any uh, further edges are the smallest e experimentally relevant sets in the sense that all bigger sets that contain them as subsets only have additional orthogonalities and don't change the experimental result. Now we can try to get the results that were not originally obtained. That means the results with complex components of vectors, with complex vectors, to see whether we can get again the same critical sets. And as we can see, we do. So we again get all the critical sets, Kernaghan, Cabelius, and so on, when we use not real but complex components. And now if we add more components, for example, I added here one, then what we get are new vectors, new critical vectors that are bigger than any previous ones. That means that they are bigger than even original Perez or our previous master set. And that indicates that we can obtain bigger sets as shown here. So if we use these vector components, plus minus one, plus minus i, and plus minus two, we get this master set, which contains one KS set and 21 non-KS sets. And in that way, we exhaust all possibilities of forming vectors with these elementary components. And we can get such a distribution, which is shown here from the smallest Cabellos set till the biggest set with 290 vertices and 193 edges of all critical sets. So all these sets here are critical and experimentally relevant. That means that with our new approach, we can simply put any components, the simplest possible components, and get any KS class of KS sets that we want and that we need for the purpose of quantum computation because for quantum computation, we actually need big sets as shown here for handling the inputs and outputs. So here we have got graph set where the edges again represent orthogonality and the vertices represent vectors and the, the whole stabilizer set is corresponding to the set 
of input and output handling instructions. That means we do need as massive sets as possible for all possible applications, for, all, for construction of all possible gates. And we illustrated obtaining such possible gates here. And the other one is in six dimensions, which is shown here and which represents the extension of the Cabello's star set, 21.7, which his group found a few years ago and which they were unable to extend to any bigger set that would contain such a set. We see that with our approach, it directly follows from the basic vector components they use, where omega means a cubic root of one and is a complex number. When we put these four components into our program, we get all these sets and many more. And as you can see, we can extend this star set by first changing the graphical representation to a triangular one, which I've shown to be equivalent to, to the original star representation in my Physical Review A paper from last year. And then we can show that by adding these delta featured edges at this scissor point, we can extend it directly to form such KS sets and also to contain many other sets that can be viewed as direct extension of these sets. We can look at the whole class of these six-dimensional KS sets and we can also here see that the master set which we obtained from 0, 1, omega and omega squared contains 834 vertices and 1609 edges which actually consists of four chi sets as opposed to that previous splitting where we had only one chi set and all the others were non chi sets and these three 81 162 are all mutually isomorphic what is important here is that the sets that we obtained in that way are unconnected so this set consists of four unconnected subsets that don't share any vertices. What we can also show here is perhaps that I predicted rain in spite of the fact that there is zero probability of falling a single drop from the sky. And as we can see here, there were several drops of rain falling on my computer <laughs> while I was presenting this. Okay, that's all, folks. So, taken together, we have shown that with our new vector generation programs and algorithms, we can obtain all the master sets that were obtained within the last 50 years in hundreds of papers. And we can obtain them on any PC in practically no time. And actually, we can do much more. We can generate any number of chi sets, any master sets, in whatever coordinatization we wanted or will have the need of. So that applies to any dimension, any number of vertices, and 
edges and that frees us from the need to store any number of already obtained vertices and edges. So with this, we can just move forward and serve the quantum computation future design in whatever way possible and needed. But for just now, it's the wine and cheese time and we are just going to celebrate the obtained results. Goodbye, folks. Now we have to find 116. So we will allow me to put you on the left. <laughs> This is it. This is it.